Well, and welcome to another edition of Two Things with the Disability Policy for All. Today we have the great fortune to be talking to Bruce Darling, who is a organizer for that. Today we today we will be talking about a a new legislation that is called the Disability Integration Act. So, so welcome, Bruce. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here. This is so cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the first question is, I'm aware of your work helping, helping to develop the Disability Integration Act. So thank you for sharing your knowledge. Can you share the history of the Disability Integration Act? And what will the act do to help people with disabilities? Okay, so ADAPT has been working to free our people from institutions for oh my, like 26 years. And we've had different kinds of legislation through all those years. And a lot of it had been focused on Medicaid and the service systems there. So we got um, the Community First Choice Option put into Medicaid law during the Affordable Care Act. So we've got stuff in law that allows people to live in the community. But what we don't have is the basic civil right. So we shifted our focus with this legislation and we're giving people, the legislation would assure that people have their civil and constitutional right to live in the community rather than be forced into institutions. And I, I like to think about my role in this because this bill was actually written by our community. We took all of the reports and things about how people were institutionalized, the personal testimonies and stories, and basically, I'm, I'm old so we did it like this in the old days, we clipped out all of the little examples of things that happened and then started to put them into piles so that we could craft the specific wording in the legislation. So I feel like I'm more of a conduit for the legislation that our community developed and most importantly people with disabilities developed you know basically through their institutionalization so it really honors them. Um, and then what does it do? Uh, that was the second part right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I, you know, I told you my memory's not so good. Um, so the things that it does is basically it says that if you are an individual with a disability who's eligible for institutional placement, that you have the right to live in the community. It states it outright, that this is an absolute right. And frankly, it's something that's guaranteed to you under the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. It's guaranteed to all of us. Um, the difference is that people with disabilities get that taken away simply because we need long-term services and supports. And then, so it says there's this whole global, like, we, we have the right to be live in the community, but then there's, some, there's the piece that talks about specific prohibitions because there are a lot of ways people stuff us into institutions. Sometimes they say, you have the wrong disability, or you got your disability at the wrong age, or you, you, you're too disabled, you cost too much, they won't pay enough for the supports you need, um, or there isn't enough affordable, accessible, integrated housing, where, which is independent of services, where you can live. Those are all ways that states and uh, managed care companies push us into institutions. The, the law says all of these individual things specifically are illegal, or the legislation says that they will be illegal. And that's, that's really the exciting part for me, because that's the piece that people with disabilities wrote with their lived experience and institutionally. It honors them. Um, and then it does a couple other little cute things that are fun. Like, it recognizes that this is so fundamental. Um, other Americans think of freedom as like, they don't even think about it as a right because it's just something they have. It's like air and they're in it. We think about it and worry about it constantly. So what this bill does, it says, if you're taking this away from us, you really are doing something seriously bad, so it gives us punitive damages so that we can get the lawyers to actually take our cases and sue the people who need to be sued so we can be free. What does punitive mean? Okay, so honestly, I had, it means punishing, basically. Basically, it's the big money. I thought, uh, and for the record, 
I didn't write this section of the bill. I wasn't part. I had actually people who did the lawyer side kind of stuff. But basically, it's the when you hear that someone got an award, you know, so um, the court or the judge gave them an, uh, basically a big award because they were truly discriminated against. You know, so that's what punitive damages are. So what's important about that is the individual gets the money, it sends a message to the people who discriminated that that's really bad and you should not do it, but it also brings in lawyers who are willing to do those cases. And that's one of the difficulties we have is because we don't really have the lawyers to take on these kinds of cases now. Okay, thanks. Um, earlier um, in the month, we, I, I talked to someone about the money follows the person grants that will be expiring at the end of the month. Um, and it just, just occurred to me that is this connected to that? So this builds on all of the work that was done with the, oh my, all of these different things. The Real Choice Systems Change Grants, Money Follows the Person, um, oh my, there's um, Real Choice the Community, all the former versions of legislation, yeah. the balancing, and stuff, there's all sorts of policy on this. So it builds on that, but what's exciting is it takes it out of the realm of Medicaid programs and like all of that stuff and puts it into civil rights. So instead of this being about how other people can serve us, it's what we as people have a right to that's important with this legislation. So it takes it to a completely different place. Oh, so we're in control. Right. I mean, and, well, first off, we wrote it. <laughs> so that's the kind of, we're really in control. Um, we're making it happen. And it's about us. It's not about services and supports and the things that other people need to, you know, other people do and are interested in. This is about our fundamental right as people, which is really cool. Oh, wow. Um, the next question is, how will this legislation help people with disabilities? Okay, it's a great question. So, you know, for us in New York, there are like these gaps, well actually everywhere, but there are gaps in the service systems where like maybe you have the wrong disability. So in New York, a good example is people who have dementia. They're, they basically, if you had dementia and you had a significant amount of assistance needed, the state would just say, you need to go to an institution or a nursing facility. And you, you wouldn't have any option of community-based services. There are other gaps in different parts of the country this says those gaps are illegal and that if you're providing, if you're paying for institutionalization, you need to pay for the things that people need to live in the community. And that, that really just changes how everything, so it fills in those gaps or it tells them they have to fill in the gaps. It addresses the, the need for affordable, accessible, integrated housing. And we know that that's going to take a long time to get fixed. So we gave them basically 10 years. So it's only like 12 years, but basically what the legislation does is says, we know you have to work on this so that people can live in the community. You have 10 years to develop a transition plan like in the ADA, or 10 years you have to develop a transition plan, then you have 10 years to implement it. So what that does is that forces, that basically gives them the time to deal with the housing and all the infrastructure that we need, but we get our rights on day one with the legislation. Okay, great. Thanks. How will this law fit into the new the home community based rule? Okay, that's a that's a great question because the what we did was we looked at okay so when I say we I I'm, that's an exaggeration probably um, Sam Crane from the Autistic Self Advocacy Network did a lot of work on the the definition of what's in the community or what is community because that was the hardest thing we had to figure out. We have a right to be integrated in the community, but there's a lot of opinions about what integrated means. And sometimes what they mean is, you know, you're in a segregated building in the community, and they say, isn't that in the community? No, that's not. That's not integrated. So what we did was we took, we, Sam, took the different definitions, including the rule, the, the HCBS rules, and then we strengthened them. So basically those rules were strengthened in this. It's a higher standard than what is in the HCBS rules for community integration. 
because what we want to do is push people to do more than they were doing. And then the other thing that we did was we were worried that some of the provider groups might attack us because if we were in Medicaid, we would be cutting off their money and people get really mad when you cut off their money. <laughs> so what we did was we put this in civil rights law. We strengthened it so we're not touching the money. They can still get it if they want as long as we get our rights. So that it balances things for everyone, I think. Okay, thank you. Is there anything else? <coughs> Is there anything else that you would like to talk about about the uh, Disability Integration Act? Well, I'm excited because we well we've we've gotten a lot of support. So we're still struggling to get uh, people to co-sponsor. So that's a it's very important for all of us to reach out to our federal legislators to ask them to co-sponsor this legislation and get on board and support our civil and constitutional right to live in the community. It is exciting because it's bipartisan legislation. So we so Senator Schumer introduced it in the Senate. Representative Gibson, oh, and Senator Schumer's a Democrat. Representative Gibson, who's a Republican, introduced it in the House. And we've, uh, we've gotten a number of co-sponsors, including Representative Sensenbrenner from Wisconsin, who's a Republican, who's on this bill. This is really exciting, and that's only happening because people with disabilities are doing the work at home to get people on the bill. So we have to keep it up and uh, keep working on this thing. So, And I know I appreciate you doing your part in highlighting this for everyone. It's really an honor to be here, and I'm excited to do this with you. Well, thank you, and that's the purpose of this. So let's hope it will um, get past. Thank you, and if you have any questions about this or any other policy issues, please go to the AUCD webpage and look for this week's pol this week's in brief. And if you have any questions or comments about this week's Tuesdays with Liz, please leave them in the space below. Thank you and have a nice day. Thanks again for Thank it. Thank you so much. This is cool. Bye. <laughs> Bye.